Hey everyone, welcome to tutorial number 10. In this video, I'll be talking about patterns. To put things very broadly, patterns provide a means of sequencing data through algorithmic and computational processes. Usually, patterns are used to generate a sequence of synths, allowing the user to dynamically create and manipulate textures, drones, rhythms, but patterns are not limited to sound synthesis. They can be used to sequence MIDI data, control graphical interfaces, and much more. Because patterns take the idea of sequencing to a fairly abstract level, and because the pattern library is so diverse, it can be difficult to get started with patterns. But fortunately, patterns are one of the most, if not the most, well-documented aspects of the language. In the help documentation, under Browse, Streams, Patterns, Events, and at the top, there's a practical guide to patterns, written by H. James Harkins. This is a great resource for useful, well-paced, and detailed information about patterns. And seriously, you should read it. Also, Ron Quivilla has a chapter on events and patterns in the Super Collider book, which is very thorough and definitely worth reading as well. There's another tutorial in the help documentation called Understanding Streams, Patterns, and Events, which is helpful. And you might also consider taking a look at the pattern help file, which gives a brief but solid introduction and some examples. Finally, if you simply want to browse the pattern library yourself, you can click on Patterns and then Browse by Category. Let's begin with a simple synth diff, which generates a sine wave, pans it in the stereo field, and applies a simple amplitude envelope. We're going to start with a pattern called pbind, which responds to the play message by generating a sequence of events. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of what exactly an event is, but if you want to learn more, I will refer you again to Harkin's Practical Guide, in particular, Chapter 8. There are several predefined event types, and the default and most common type is called the note event. A note event simply generates a synth on the audio server, and we're going to use pbind to sequence these note events. It's worth taking a look at the pbind help file, which has some instructive examples, and in particular, there's a section titled SynthDef and Event, which outlines the typical approach to using SynthDef and PBind together, as we're about to do. PBind expects a series of symbol-value pairs, also called key-value pairs. First, we specify the type of event that we want PBind to generate, in this case, note events. Specifying the event type determines the subsequent expected symbols. Since note events generate synths, we need to tell pbind which synth def we want to use, and this is done with the key instrument, followed by the name of the synth def. If we play this pbind now, even without specifying anything like frequency, amplitude, etc., this alone is actually enough to generate sound. We hear a stream of short sinusoids at a rate of one per second, and we can confirm this by checking the node tree. Pbind.play returns an event stream player, and this is the object that actually generates the events. I've stored the player in the global variable p, so I can run p.stop to terminate the stream. And command period will also work. Now, because note is the default event type, technically we don't need to specify this symbol value pair. We can just delete it and everything still works. Because pbind generates a stream of events, it's only logical that we should be able to control the length of time between successive events. This is usually called delta time, and is specified by providing a value for the dur key, which is short for duration. In the previous example, we didn't specify a value for dur, and so the default value of the note event was used, which happens to be 1, and that's why we heard 1 synth per second. In this case, we'll get a synth every half second. And here's 10 synths per second. But a constant delta time like this doesn't really give us much flexibility. Rather than specify a fixed numerical value for door, we can use a pattern to control the data over time. So let's take a look at a very common pattern called pseq. pseq takes an array of values and sequences through these values in order a certain number of times. Here, the delta time will output 0.6, 0.15, and 0.15 again, infinitely. 
Just a quick note here, to print the output of a pattern in real time, we use the trace method. This is useful for debugging, or in general, just visualizing your data. We still haven't even specified frequency, amplitude, or anything like that, which means pbind has been using the default values for the keys as defined in the default note event. In particular, we're hearing middle C at an amplitude of 0.1. But because we're generating synths, this means that the arguments in our synth def are available as valid pbind keys. And these values will override the default event parameters. So let's control the frequency of the sine waves using another pseq. Let's take a step back for a second and make sure we understand what's happening here. pbind.play returns an event stream player, which is creating synths on the audio server. The delta time and pitch are determined by sequential patterns that repeat infinitely. For each note event, the next item from each internal pattern is embedded into the note event, thereby controlling that particular aspect of the sound. Suppose the arrays in these two sequential patterns weren't the same size. In this example, these two P-seeks will fall out of phase with each other. But pbind doesn't know or care. All pbind does is pull the next value from each of its internal value patterns and creates a synth using those values. In many cases, we don't want an infinite stream of events. Instead, we want a particular number of events. The rule here is that the resulting event stream is only as long as its shortest internal value pattern. So here, if we change the number of repeats in the door pattern from infinite to four, then we'll only get four iterations of that value array, which means 12 note events in total, and then the stream will stop. If we set the number of repeats of the frequency pattern to, let's say, two, then it will yield exactly eight values. This makes the frequency pattern even shorter than the door pattern, which means the event stream player created by pbind will only generate eight note events. So that's the essence of how pseq works. I wanna take this moment to point out that you don't always have to deal in cycles per second. While it is technically possible to convert to MIDI note numbers like this, You can actually just create a MIDI note key and provide MIDI note numbers explicitly. You might find it sort of surprising that you can use the symbol MIDI note even though it's not defined in our synth def. This is possible because there is a hierarchy of predefined keys for certain events, including the note event, detailed in the pbind help file. But these predefined keys and their inherent hierarchy are only available to you if you follow the naming conventions here. For example, if you use freak, lowercase f-r-e-q, in your synth def for the pitch of the sound, then you have the option of using midi note, note, degree, and so forth in your p-bind. If you use some other name, like hertz or cycles or whatever, then this hierarchy is not available to you. Just to demonstrate this, let's say I used the argument hertz instead of freak. And then let's say I create an event stream player. Well, in this case, MIDI note is getting converted to frequency values, but neither MIDI note nor freak exist as arguments in the synth def. So the default value for hertz, 440, is what we actually hear. So to control the pitch of the sound, we'd have to specify a hertz pattern explicitly, you know, which is fine, but we would be foregoing the flexibility and convenience of the built-in pitch hierarchy. So what you should take away from this is that it is to your advantage to use in your synth thefts the arguments listed in the pbind help file, such as freak, amp, sustain, etc. although it is not by any means required that you do so. It's also worth noting that when dealing with pitch in a pbind, you operate at one of these hierarchy levels. For example, you'd just use MIDI note, C transpose, and harmonic in a p-bind, but generally it's not a good idea to mix and match from different tiers. For example, if you specify a pattern for freak and a pattern for MIDI note, well, it just doesn't make sense. 
you'd just be providing either conflicting information or redundant information. Okay, so let's change Hertz back to Freak, as it originally was, and take things in a new direction. In particular, I'm going to talk about some patterns that generate random numbers. P exprand generates a certain number of random values with an exponential distribution between a given minimum and maximum. P white, which gets its name from white noise, generates random values within a range with a linear distribution. Okay, so for the sake of making interesting sound, it's probably about time to add some patterns to control additional synth depth arguments, like attack, release, pan, and so on. Here I'll randomize the attack and release times so that each sine wave is fairly long. Of course, lots of simultaneous signal means that we run the risk of clipping, so I'll lower the amplitude significantly, but I'll maintain a bit of randomness here as well. And I'll also randomize the pan position so that each individual sinusoid is panned randomly in the stereo field, but stays away from extreme left or extreme right. Let's take a look at the node tree again. We can see that the event stream player is generating a whole bunch of synths. And we're finally starting to hear the strength and flexibility of composition with patterns. There's much more to discuss, so let's push forward. Suppose we want these sine waves to align with a harmonic series. Patterns understand mathematical operations and methods, so we can use the round method on the frequency pattern. We can achieve the same effect with a different tier of pitch symbols, in particular MIDI note and harmonic. And I'll also trace the partial number. You know, these high partials kind of pop out of the texture a little bit more than I'd like, so let's say we want the higher partials to be not quite as loud as the lower ones. To put it a different way, we need to have our amplitude pattern rely on the values from the pitch pattern. For this, we use the pattern P key, which copies values from a pattern at an earlier key, in this case, harmonic. All we need to do now is map these partial numbers onto a range that's suitable for amplitude. And I think I'm just going to take the reciprocal of the partial number. Uh, and I guess multiply by 0.3 just to give our signal extra headroom. One thing we haven't done yet is give ourselves the ability to manipulate patterns in real time while the pattern is playing. This is usually done by enclosing a p-bind within a p-def, the syntax of which is very similar to midi-def and synth-def. Once inside a p-def, there's also no longer any need for the global variable. Once playing, we can simply change the contents of the p-bind, re-evaluate, and the changes take effect without disrupting the event stream. For example, we can change the fundamental. out some of the higher partials. We can change the 
attack and release times. And we can stop the stream by replacing play with stop. Even if you're not planning on doing real-time pattern manipulation, it's never really a bad idea to use PDEF. Okay, I'm going to do a total switch here and move away from harmonic textures and turn the attention to rhythm. I'm going to change the sound source from sine waves to buffer playback. And actually, I'm going to make an entirely new synth diff. But first, I want to load some sound sources into buffers. So on my desktop, I've got a small library of the sounds of an acoustic guitar body being struck in different ways, roughly categorized by low, mid, and high range sounds. I'm going to use a dictionary to store these sounds, which I usually find to be one of the most flexible options. Okay, so I've added three keys to dictionary D, and each key points to an array of the appropriate sound files, low, mid, and high, loaded into buffers. So here are a few random low hits, and some high ones, and I'll make my synth diff. Uh, as was the case before, I'm going to keep things very simple with only buff num, rate, and amplitude arguments. Just to make sure it works. Okay, so let's build another P bind. First, we need the name of the synth diff, which is buff play. We also need a pattern for delta time, and for now let's give ourselves a steady stream of 0.12 seconds per event. Now, for which buffer to play, we have some options, and it really depends on what we're trying to do. We could use pseq and provide an explicit buff num order, but I want to take this opportunity to introduce another pattern called prand. Unlike pwhite, which selects a number from a given range, P rand randomly selects an item from a given collection. So what I'm going to do is concatenate the three arrays within our dictionary, which gives us the low, mid, and high sound files all together in one array, and then let P rand choose from this array indefinitely. And for now, I'm going to set the playback rate and amplitude to just be fixed values. If we only want certain buffers, we can just modify the buffer pattern and reevaluate since we're inside of a PDF. Often it's preferable to think about rhythm in terms of beats per minute rather than floating point second values. And this is actually pretty easy to do. Let's say we want these sound files to roll in as 16th notes at 128 beats per minute in a time signature of 4-4. Four, four. First thing I'll do is change the door pattern so that the raw delta time is literally 1 16th of our theoretical 4-4 four, four measure. Then we can use the stretch key, again this is in the pbind help file right here, to stretch the raw delta times by the length in seconds of one bar of 4-4 four, four at 128 BPM. So the real question is how do we calculate seconds per bar from beats per minute. Well, we start with beats per minute, 128. We can divide by 60 to get beats per second. We can invert this value to get seconds per beat. 
And since there are four beats per bar, we just multiply this value by four. So one bar of 4-4 four, four at 128 beats per minute lasts exactly 1.875 seconds. Plug this in for the stretch key, and we've got 16th notes at our desired tempo. I want to quickly throw a few more patterns at you. First, there's PX Rand, which is like P Rand, but the difference is PX Rand will never choose the same value twice in a row. It's a subtle difference, but it's worth mentioning. There's also PW Rand, which makes random choices from a collection according to a second array of weights. Here, PW Rand will choose the high sound 80% of the time, the mid-range sound 15% of the time, and the low sound 5% of the time. Of course, it's not exactly easy to provide an array of weights whose values add up to 1. And for this reason, whatever you put in the weights array, you can append the message normalize sum, like this. There's also pshuf, which takes an array of values and chooses a random order in which to play them. And this means each element in the array gets picked exactly once before the pattern repeats. But in the interest of moving forward, I'll leave it to you to experiment with pshuf on your own. Let's go back a few steps and constrain some of this randomness in order to create a more regular accent pattern. Although there are multiple ways to do this, I'm going to manipulate the amplitude pattern. Uh, and now, of course, we could write out something specific and use pseek, like this, which gives us accents on beats 1 and 3. But, you know, typing all those numbers is kind of lame. So duplication with the exclamation point uh, in combination with concatenation is a little bit faster and cleaner. But we're ignoring a very important and powerful feature of patterns, which is that we can nest patterns inside of one another. In the following code, the overall amplitude pattern is a pseek, which contains a value of 0.8, followed by a px brand, which outputs seven random values. This means one iteration of the enclosing pseek will output eight values in total, and this eight value sequence is repeated indefinitely. Doing it this way, we preserve some degree of randomness. We take advantage of patterns while we still maintain a consistent and perceivable accent pattern. Well, since I've bothered to split these sound files into low, mid, and high ranges, how about this? Let's always get a low sound file on beat 1 and always a high sound file on beat 3. So here I'll have to change my buff pattern, and again, I'm going to be demonstrating nested patterns. So I'll start overall with a pseek, and I'm also going to space this pattern on multiple lines for clarity. A low hit on the first beat, and then seven sixteenth notes that can be anything really, a high hit halfway through the measure, and then seven more sixteenth notes, which again can be any sound file. And this overall sequence is repeated indefinitely. Let's uh, randomize the playback rate a bit to make things just a little less predictable. Okay, so you might notice that the stream has a bit of a hiccup when we re-evaluate the PDF. Why does this happen? Well, this is because we are not quantizing this pattern. Quantization is the process of locking a pattern's onset time to a fixed rhythmic grid. Since we're dealing with a 4-4 pattern at 128 beats per minute, one sensible option is to quantize this pattern to a grid as determined by the duration of one bar. This means any changes to the pattern won't take effect until the next downbeat. There are different ways to do this, but here's what I usually do. First, we set the event stream player's quant argument, in parentheses, immediately following the play message, like this. And once it's playing, and if I want to make changes to the PDF, I use this quantization syntax. 
Here, uh, what I'll do is change the playback rate significantly. And you can hear that these changes only occur when the next downbeat arrives. Now, of course, this means you can quantize multiple patterns to the same grid. So here's a modified version of the sine wave pattern from earlier which outputs 16th notes, just like the guitar pattern. So what I'm going to do is start the acoustic guitar pattern first. And now, whenever I feel like it, I'll start the new sine wave pattern. quant values ensure that these two patterns are locked to the same grid. Let's make a few real-time changes. I'll uh, increase the buffer playback rate and also transpose the sine waves down by a major sixth. Okay, now I'll make the uh, unaccented notes even quieter and transpose the sine waves up two semitones. And that's about all for tutorial number 10. As you can probably tell from this video, patterns are incredibly powerful, and there's so much you can do with them. I've covered a lot of new material in this video, but at the same time, there's a lot of pattern material that I haven't covered. It's possible I might return to this topic in a later video for some intermediate pattern things, but for now, don't forget about H. James Harkin's practical guide in the help documentation, and Ron Quivela's chapter in the SuperCollider book. In any case, I hope this video has enough clear information to push you in a direction with enough momentum that you can start making some interesting music with patterns. In the next video, I'll talk about how SuperCollider integrates with the Open Sound Control Protocol, or OSC for short. If you've been enjoying this video series so far, please consider giving a thumbs up and subscribing to my channel. Thanks so much for watching, and see you next time.